Good evening, software engineers. Sorry about no video yesterday. Um, like many of you have told me, and I've talked to some of my advisees, sometimes getting stuff at, done at home is harder than getting stuff done at school. Um, like a lot harder. Uh, Friday was pretty nuts here. We had basically Zoom meetings from, gosh, 8.30 a.m. straight to 2 p.m. I mean, it was just back to back to back to back. And none of them, they weren't all mine. You know, my kindergartner had the first two, um, and I was banished to downstairs doing stuff on my laptop. So, you know, there's only so many recording studios in the sheriff household. So, and I apologize if I'm a little lower energy right now. Said five-year-old is currently sleeping uh, a couple bedrooms over, and I'm trying not to get a little too excited um, so I don't wake anyone up. So, but I did want to get something out tonight because there has been some uh, updates, and I want to make sure you know what all is going on so that you kind of know, you know, what's coming up. Uh, first off, uh, the, uh, the the goof for today, I don't know if you've seen this particular meme yet. Um, it amused me to no end. Um, but, you know, if you look at your streaming subscriptions, Netflix, $120 a year, Hulu, $108, Disney Plus, $96, and UVA. <laughs> now, in all fairness, it's not the whole year, but I did see that, and that did make me giggle just a bit. So um, I appreciated the uh, the kind words I got back from some folks who appreciated the Oculus Quest riff. Um, to the people that asked, yes, I do have Beat Saber on it. Uh, yes, there is room in here to play Beat Saber. Eh, you know, um, th there was a request to stream some games on Twitch, which I think I'll probably do that too, but um, we're going to get my feet underneath me first to make sure I know what's going on. So um, next thing I wanted to do was talk to you a little bit about what you told me in your survey. So let me jump over to my browser window here. First off, um, thank you to everyone who submitted the survey. It's been very, very helpful. Um, looking here at your internet access, looks like basically everyone is okay as far as getting the material, so that's good. Um, YouTube seems good. Great. Glad to hear it. Glad that's going to work out. Um, most everyone, there's a, there's a few exceptions, and that's totally fine. Totally fine about breaking up the material. Um, so, yep, I'm going to keep doing that. Now, the trick with that is I've never broken this material up into smaller chunks. So I have a good idea of what I'm going to do, but I'm still trying to figure it out exactly. So I appreciate your patience as that changes. Um, I will keep it kind of week by week and I'll show you where that's going to be in just a second. But anyway, moving on. How do you want to know about new content? You want an email. Okay, great. Um, if that's what I, you know, of the 123, 92 of you said you wanted, just email the collab list. So if you're one of the people who doesn't want that, set up a filter, I guess. Um, so there you go. Um, I am going to keep the schedule page updated with all the links. I'm also going to be creating threads on Piazza for every online video. So you can go in and post questions there and I'll come back and answer those. Maybe I'll record my answers. I don't know. I'll, we'll figure something out, but that's a great place to, to post those questions. And I am going to hold a live Q and a sometime this coming week. I'll let you know when, when that fig gets figured out. Um, Sounds like the office hour idea is going to work. I'm going to show you what that looks like in just a minute because office hours are going to start pretty soon. And then um, by far, by, by far, the number one comment that I got about a concern was people not working on the teams. So uh, I talked to the TAs about that, and I think we have some ideas about that, um, particularly in the context of the credit, no credit thing and how that's going to work. Um, Short version, and I am still working out the XP and exactly how it's going to work, but the short version about this is going to be this. Um, if you are trying to take your foot off the gas pedal on 3240, as far as I just want to get a credit and just get done, totally fine. The thing you should not work on would then be the quizzes um, because that doesn't affect anyone else. Um, but if you completely disengage from the project, I mean, the project itself is worth 50,000, then the team evaluations are gonna be bad. The evaluations from the staff are gonna be bad. Um, I don't think there's any way you can get a credit if you just completely leave the project. So if you feel like you need to dial back 3240, totally understand, let it be the quizzes. Let, it, let that be the thing that you just kind of step back from. Um, 
I think that's just the easiest thing and the fairest thing for everyone involved. Um, if you have concerns about that, please let me know. I want to make sure that you are not stressing out any more than we all already are, I guess. But um, I want to make sure you're getting the learning objectives from the course as well. So with that said, let me now jump over to the schedule. So I'm, I'm, I've started updating here. So I, I be looking here at the schedule to see what all's going on. Um, main things that you should see are the way the quizzes are going to work. So as you can see right here, quiz three, 323, that is Monday. Now, what I'm planning on doing is releasing, there's four quizzes left, releasing a quiz on a Monday, and you have a week to do it and then turn it into the next Monday, then I'll release the next quiz. And we'll do that through the rest of the semester. There's one week, there's one in between right here, four, six, where we won't have a quiz um, just because we're in the middle of a unit. But um, this way, you only have one quiz to worry about. You can do it whenever you want to. It is going to be open note. Um, it, seemed, it seemed reasonable. Um, you'll still have an opportunity to make up quizzes during the final exam period, which I have no clue how that's going to work just yet. But I intend to maintain that policy of you can make up the quizzes. The other thing is there will not be a sprint check on Monday, but I am asking the TAs to check in with their, um, the scrum masters of the teams they're working with just to get a feel for how the team is feeling. And then we are going to do a sprint check every Monday for the rest of the, the semester. So there's, there's sprint checks four, five, and six. For each of those sprint checks, you will get the sprint score as normal. You'll have a sprint report as normal. We are going to do team evaluations. I am going to go in and tweak the evaluations to better grasp how people are working. Um, and also so that you can rate yourself to say what challenges you're going through. And also um, if you're trying to, uh, you know, how, how you're able to contribute as well. So I think if we can focus on let's try to get the projects done um, and work through the aspects of the projects and then also still the... Um, uh, artifacts for the people who still have artifacts, then I think we'll capture most of the things going on. So just pay attention to those. And we, of course, will be continuing to update you as, as we roll all of this out. Uh, someone asked about Guided Practice F. Guided Practice F is posted. It is under the Guided Practice um, thing in the student resources, um, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute as after I get through... Uh, the slides for object-oriented decomposition. Uh, so anyway, it's here. Um, I don't have a due date for it yet um, because for all the other reasons we don't have due dates for anything yet. But it, it, you'll have time to do it over the next, you know, several, several days. So again, don't stress about it. I mean, if any of you are stressing about missing anything, I promise you, you're not missing anything. Um, but, you know, do let me know. Um, I'm trying to work through it as, as the best I can. Shockingly enough, it's hard to turn a class into an online course in four days. Well, it's been a week, but still, I was coming back from Portland. All right, so I think that's all I got as far as logistics goes. And that was a solid, looking for my timer on the recording, a solid eight minutes. <laughs> and I want to keep these short. So let me go ahead and jump over to the slides and jump into lecture slide mode. So... I left off on the last video talking about functional decomposition and what someone uh, asked about more, you know, concrete examples. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you some um, as I roll out the next bit for the um, results for the um, guided practice. But what we're really looking at here, this example right here for functional decomposition is this is an aspect of the system, right? This is one kind of main feature, generating a payroll. We can assume that this system actually has a lot more stuff going on in it. Maybe some other human resources stuff, maybe some more, um, you know, just personnel type things. But there's a button, a lever, a feature where we want to generate the payroll. So when we generate the payroll, this is stepping through all of the functionalities that must occur. Nothing in here in this diagram that you're looking at really indicates what sort of data is being passed. You can imagine, but you don't really know exactly what's there. And that's where we get into the other type of change slides, you silly thing. I need to figure out what the magic button is, why sometimes it does it and sometimes it doesn't, but there you go. The object-oriented decomposition is where you're modeling the 
the model. <laughs> You're modeling how is the, the, the data being handled in the system? How is... Uh, how are objects being created? How What are their behaviors? And these are typically seen in systems like Java, C Sharp, um, and other typical O languages. Um, you identify an entity, you understand what that entity is, you come up with a class around the entity, you figure out what sort of functionality that entity has, and then how does that entity interact with other entities? So if we're thinking about functional decomposition as the verbs in the system, then object-oriented is the nouns. Um, object oriented would be things for thinking about a library, it would be book, patron, magazine, journal, bookshelf, that sort of thing. Whereas in a functional, we might do a functional decomposition for checking out or a functional decomposition for checking in or adding a new book to the collection or something like that. Could you do the entire library as functional decompositions? Yes, but it wouldn't be one diagram, right? Because run library is not a function, but checking out a book is, adding to the collection is, returning a book is. So you could have a series of functional decompositions that explained all the things that went on in the library because each of those are behaviors that take place. But object-oriented, you typically have one document, a class diagram usually, that explains everything about the system as far as what are the objects that you care about. So, um, is there one right way to do an object-oriented? No, of course not. Why would it be that simple? So, some people like to start with, um, I have a library. How do I split it? Okay, well, I have books. I have journals. So, so the top-down approach, right? You split it up into chunks as you go. Then there's the idea of, okay, I want everything in my system to revolve around the patron. You know, the person who comes in to check, in the, check out a book. What are the things that person can do? How can that patron interact with other things? And you start building around it, building around it, building around it. Sometimes the customer is going to say, I need to see this part of the system first. And you don't really have a choice. But it's really just kind of your personal preference about how you think about a system. So when we're trying to do these OO decompositions, we want to figure out what are those modules? What are those good cohesive things that are don't have too much um, coupling with other modules. Um, how are they connected? Basically, do they call each other? Is one part of another one? Is one a superclass of another? Um, do we wrap them together in large level packages? So these are things that you've thought about probably when you've actually coded, but not necessarily from a design perspective. Now, one core way that we communicate Object-oriented decompositions is through UML, the Unified Modeling Language. Now, you might remember way back when when we talked about UML in the context of um, Rational, the Rational Unified process. UML is still around. UML is used all over the place, mainly because it is an, basically an industry-accepted way of talking about design. How can we communicate different design ideas to other engineers in a way that is kind of a lingua franca, like, Everyone should know the basics of UML, and most everyone does. If I was to show you a random UML diagram, you could probably look at it and basically understand what's going on because you kind of understand, hey, look, this thing's a rectangle. Rectangle has a class name, and it has functions, and it has members. You can figure it out. The thing is that, that there's a lot of different UML diagrams out there. There's not just the class diagram, even though that's the one you're used to seeing. Remember those use case diagrams we looked at way back when in requirements? technically part of UML as well. So um, here are some examples of different UML diagrams, use cases, which we talked about, class diagrams. I'm gonna give you a few more of example. We'll look at a few of these in particular, but um, for our purposes, we're really gonna home in on the class diagram. Said that. I'll come back to that slide because I wanna do the, the class diagram. This is your traditional, when you think about design, oh, oh, this is what you get. So right here, um, basic class enrollment sort of structure here with student you have the class name then you have name address phone number yada yada state it gives you the state when you have a student a student's going to have a particular name a particular address a particular phone number the state is what makes one object unique from another object classic standard java basic stuff here and then below that is eligible to enroll get seminars taken those are going to be behaviors. Those are be actions that that object can take. Now, one thing I really want you to notice when I look at student here 
is that there are no notions of data type, no notions of public versus private. Um, the functions aren't camel cased or underscore connected or anything like that. A true design document in this flavor is going to try and remove as much implementation bias as possible. You could apply this exact document to Java or C Sharp or whatever, and it would be fine because it's just communicating what the objects are supposed to be, not necessarily how you're going to build them. Is it okay to draw a UML diagram that has data types, public and private, actual function names? Of course it is. Absolutely it is. Particularly if you're under a constraint that you have to build with a particular language, then sure, go ahead. Um, or if you've already, you know, you know this is the path you're going to do. That's fantastic. Notice the other arrows that we have in this di in this diagram here. So we have one enrolled, one dot dot star between student and enrollment. So the one and one dot dot star are the cardinalities. Those are things that explain the type of relationship between here. Uh, enrolled, the, the word on the line is basically just there to give you some way of reading it. So a student is enrolled in, you kind of read it in that way. You can actually explain some business logic with these cardinalities. What this is saying right here is one student must be enrolled in at least one, all the way across, seminar. Must have at least one enrollment, one to many, one dot dot star, one to many. Because there's a one on the student side and a one on the enrollment side means that there has to be something there. A student with no enrollment means they're not a student, means they couldn't exist here. So we've actually already indicated some constraints on our system. Shouldn't use the word constraint, that's overloaded. We've, we've introduced some requirements, I guess, uh, of, for our business logic. Um, just with this diagram right here. Same thing with student to seminar. A student zero dot dot star, zero dot dot star seminar on waiting list shows that a seminar could have no one on the waiting list. It could have infinite students on a waiting list, uh, kind of like, you know, cloud computing on certain semesters. Um, and a student doesn't have to be on any waiting list or they could be on all the waiting lists like most second years trying to get into upper level electives. So there you go. Another interesting one, professor to seminar, note it's zero dot dot one and zero dot dot um, uh, star. Um, and there's a little tag on there that says some seminars may not have an instructor. This is like a note putting there. Is it possible to have a seminar that has no in professor assigned to it at UVA? Heck yeah, there is. You know that professor staff? Man, that person, whew, they get around. They teach everything, um, you know. Imagine for a moment that we have um, a course that we know we're going to offer in the fall, but we're still hiring new faculty members. We often will put down that course, but with no instructor. It's just listed as staff. So that's one way we could indicate that that's a possibility here in the diagram. So we like, we really like UML diagrams. We really like class diagrams because they give us a lot of information. And you can model an entire system in a UML diagram like this, as opposed to a functional diagram, functional decomposition diagram, where you're really focusing on a particular piece of functionality. So if I was to do a functional decomposition with this system, I might pick student enrolling in a course. So um, if I was to draw that diagram, you could, you could see that for that feature, we would start at the top of that chart and start f falling down like check, check, you have the ability to enroll, check prerequisites, check whether uh, you've paid your tuition and have no holds, check to make sure there's openings in the, in the course. If all that happens, then enroll. That would be the functional de decomposition. We don't capture that here. We don't capture that business process. All we capture here is the relationship between those classes. So there's a place for both of these decompositions, but you have to know why you're using them. Um, I'm not going to, and honestly, if we were in normal class too, I would probably say the same thing. We're not going to stress too terribly much about, are you going to get the exact right triangle or diamond or whatever to show things? And the reason for that, I, I, I want you to see that there are reasons for them. That's why the slide stays. The reason why I don't care as much is mainly just because as long as everyone on your team understands what you're doing and you have an agreed upon nomenclature, then the exact diagram doesn't matter. The exact uh, 
well, that too. But the exact, whether using a circle or whatever, doesn't really matter as much. I would highly suggest you always use rectangles for classes because that's kind of understood. But after that point, you can kind of keep going. Matter of fact, I'll tell you right now, if you use ovals for classes on anything you turn in for me, I will get very confused. That's just one that's just, you use a rectangle. That's, you just do. More explanations. This, this, is, this is if we decided to actually go into it and say, I want to add um, cardinality, variable name, and type. So plus title string, plus means it's public. Uh, the colon then denotes over to the um, data type. Down below, the minus means it's private. And then below that, you can see the, the functionality. Now, these are all kind of pseudocode um, as opposed to actual code. I want to... Uh, jumping back slots. I know this is probably absolutely horrible for you at home, but I'm going to jump over here. And I want to look at a sequence diagram. Not that one. Yes, that's the one I wanted. I was actually trying to click on this one. Okay, so a sequence diagram is kind of like a functional decomposition in UML. And the idea here is we want to be able to, to describe um, the interactions between those modules in a way that we can follow it. Um, what is the API call path? So this is logging in using Facebook. So the user, which is the actor icon, the person icon, um, tries to get a resource um, through the web browser. It requests access to the application. There's a redirect that goes all the way back to Facebook authorization. It says, hey, can, can I log in? And Facebook says, ah, I don't know, and sends a permission form back to the user. The user inputs their information. Facebook gets it and sends it back to the web browser and says, yep, they logged into Facebook. That seems pretty cool. So once you do that, if it's granted, then there's a back and forth with access codes and uh, tokens that eventually says, yes, you are allowed to access this information. You're allowed to access this part of the system and you can now log in. There you go. This is a, I should actually switch to browser mode. This is a similar diagram to a functional de decomposition, but it gives you more information about how data is actually passing between things. Um, so architecture people, this is a diagram you probably want to be thinking about doing for your arc documents, because this is a great way of showing, well, how does data actually pass in your system when you do like OAuth login for, with Google or something along those lines. <laughs> yeah, that one wasn't OBS's fault. <laughs> that was Google slides fault. So um, where this takes us to is this. So this is the basics of guided practice F. If we were in class, what I would do at this point is I would hand out the guided practice sheet, which had a blank front and a blank back, and say, okay, I want you to do this system for a, a decomposition object-oriented and for functional. For object-oriented, you would, okay, well, let's explain it. It's an assignment submission system, so pick anything. It could be grade scope, it could be TPEGs, it could be, you know, just anything where you'd submit an assignment. Use your imagination. It doesn't really matter, but just, you know, pretend. Make reasonable assumptions. It's totally fine. If, well, for the object-oriented, you'd want to model the system. So some classes you probably would have, something like student or TA, and you kind of can move on from there. Like, what are you going to submit? How does, it, how does it get saved? That sort of thing. So you can kind of look through here and figure out well, what are my, what are my um, nouns. For the object-oriented, you don't do the entire system. Just like my example with the library, you would pick a core functionality here and then go from there. So notice that in this system, there are a bunch of actual actions that take place. There's the professor creating an assignment. There's the student submitting an assignment. There's the grading of the assignment and returning it. I would suggest you do one of those. Probably the you know student submits assignment and it's graded and returned or something along those lines. You wanna focus on a core piece of functionality that is a feature and that's what you do the decomposition of. And for this, 
I would want you to do that. I want you to do this. Um, I'm not hung up on the arrows. That's showing how data is flowing. So the arrows are very good. And you can show that someone has turned in an assignment and you've gotten their grade and you've done yada, yada, yada. Um, but focus mostly on what are the steps of the functionality that must occur. Your goal, your goal in both of these is assume you are put on a team and you need to tell other people how to do this, how we're going to build this. How do you communicate it? Okay. So. Which takes us back to this. I've copied and pasted the um, prompt here with the, the example I just, the, 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 the text, the description I just gave you. God, recording these at 1045 at night is not my best move. Um, there's a place to draw object oriented. There's a place to draw a functional. How do you want to do this? Well, um, you could print it and hand draw it and then take pictures of it and scan it and then whatever and then submit it to Gradescope. That's fine. You could go into PowerPoint, I guess, or something else that you could use to, to draw diagrams. So on, on Mac, I use a program called OmniGraffle, which is expensive, but it's what I use to make UML diagrams. But there's a lot of free UML diagrams out there, UML diagram tools you could use. You don't have to, it's an option. Architecture people, it's not an option. You have to do that for your architecture documents. And you, you really shouldn't do hand-drawn for that. Um, free UML tool online. Oh yeah, Lucidchart's a good one. I've used that one before. UML. That looks nice. Double click on it. Ooh. Ooh. So you, there's plenty of tools out there you can do to just make it and you can just screen grab it and whatever. Uh, Lucidchart is a good one. I have, I have used that one before. Um, the only thing I ask is that when you submit it to Gradescope, which Gradescope's not going to be ready until like Monday, so don't get too excited about doing this. Um, please make sure that when you submit it and you say which page is question one on that you tag it appropriately so that it actually loads properly. We had problems with this with guide to practice E with the framework one and it wasn't everyone, but there was a lot of people who just didn't say question one is on this page. Question two is on this page. Um, and it just made it harder to grade. So just try to make sure you do that. I don't care if it's on this exact piece of paper with the same title and all that sort of thing. It's going to, it'll be fine. Uh, I'll figure it out. Um, and if you want to work with other people, you zoom with them and point your camera at the screen. That's great too. If you want to do it by yourself. That's fine too. Um, that's the gist of it. Um, I will probably record another video tomorrow, maybe giving some more tips. You'll probably see them both at the same time at this rate. Um, but if you have any questions, do let me know. Um, Sorry, this video is a little longer, but I did have some more announcements in the beginning. So uh, have a good night. I hope you sleep well. hope you ha ha did something fun today. We dug a garden and then found out we weren't supposed to plant the plants until May. But I dug a big hole and put in some nice dirt. So you know what? Score one for me. I'll see you next time.